Thanks, Alistair. <coughs> good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone else who's watching uh, online. Uh, I'm Fergus Bell. Uh, I work for Dig Deeper Media, which is just me, but I go and uh, help newsrooms with their verification workflows and their digital news gathering. I'm a former UGC editor, um, and I'm going to talk about protecting social sources. Uh, I'm going to cover three different areas. So I'm going to talk about live events, and by live events I mean real-time ongoing events. Live events as in live video, so how we handle uh, an increasing amount of, of live video produced by uh, eyewitnesses. And assignments versus discovery, so uh, that sounds pretty, fairly obvious and, and we'll, we'll get to that. So first of all, protecting social sources for live, real-time, ongoing events. What, about, what do I mean here? Well, when we're communicating with individuals, can they make an informed choice? Are they in a position to make an informed choice? Are they aware of the dangers of the situation? I'm sure that everyone can think of recent examples where there has been a dangerous situation and someone has got something that you want. Um, but knowing if they are aware of the danger is something that's important because as journalists sitting in newsrooms with the wires coming in with our own tweet deck set up, we have a very good overview of what's going on. But um, as we know with communicating with reporters on the ground, we feed them information uh, so that they have the bigger picture. Social sources don't have that support. Um, and they might be making a judgment uh, based on what they know, um, but can they actually make that safe choice? Are they in a position to, to make a choice about whether they interact with you or provide you with information or content? And do you know for certain that they are out of danger? If you're going to be communicating with them and requesting something from them, what can you do to, uh, to check that the situation is safe? That might mean a little bit of extra legwork uh, in order to protect that person, um, especially if they are outside of the, the zone that you're, that you're especially looking at. And then finally, what can you realistically expect from someone in a live situation? Someone who is in a dangerous situation, someone who is in a live situation, what can you ask them to do for you um, that is realistic, fair, safe, um, not going to put them in danger, not going to hurt them or expose them to, to danger further down the line. So I'm, I've got some uh, examples to illustrate some of these points. For most of my examples, I've blurred out the, the names of the individuals involved and the news organizations. Um, the, most of the examples I will show you also the news organizations I'm using are just typical of the wider industry. I'm not necessarily calling anyone out. So this is an example that you might be familiar with. It's from the shooting at the uh, college campus in Oregon. So on the left, OMG, there's someone shooting on campus. Hi, and then underneath, hi, are you safe? Can you DM me when you find shelter? I'm a reporter for Straight away, someone chimes in, asking students to DM you right now is pathetic. It might not be pathetic, it's what, people, what we have to do as journalists, but is it really the right time? When I, get mess when I get emails asking me for something urgent and I can't deal with it at the time, I tend to, um, I tend to delay my response. Or if I get a voicemail, I'll action it when I've got time. If someone's in danger, they probably won't, oh, you know what? that person wants to speak to me, I'm very scared, but I'll file that information away um, and then I'll get back to them because they've, they've chosen the best time to communicate with me. It's probably not what they're going to be thinking. Um, it's certainly not what the audience, your same audience is thinking uh, as they are witnessing your interactions with these individuals. We're also, it's also very obvious that people now take to social media to share information about their own situation and about their safety. So they follow up. Students are running everywhere, holy God. Hi, please stay safe and keep out of danger. Um, only when you are safe uh, and if willing to speak, please let us know. Again, perhaps if you genuinely think that you want, you know, if you're genuinely concerned for someone's safety, you've got their, their Twitter handle now. You know who they are. You know where they're going to be. Um, you know where to find them. Perhaps ask them uh, at a better time. Um, again, we have people 
chiming in, members of our, our own audience, the people who will, who will be seeing this same content on our own networks, uh, shut the up, is what they say. And that's very typical of the responses, and I'm sure that many of you are familiar with, with these kinds of responses. Now, this woman has updated her followers um, because this is who she's communicating with at every stage. It's natural that she's going to uh, keep updating people. Um, and if she can't communicate, then she won't. Coordination is incredibly important when it comes to protecting social sources for this reason. So this is one tweet from a news organization. Let's call it the Green News Organization. Uh, hi, I'm an editor with Green. We hope you're safe. Uh, can we contact you to find out what, more about what's happening? Very reasonable. Except their colleague also messages them. I am with Green in New York. Can you follow me to DM if you're in a safe spot? And another colleague, are you OK? I work with Green. If you can follow me, I would love to talk to you. Please stay safe. Three people from the same news organization have now messaged this person. If you get a cold call on your telephone and you ignore it, to get two more cold calls from exactly the same uh, organization within minutes is going to start to really anger you and it's going to look a little bit like harassment. Now, if this was a one-off, it would be fine. But Red jumps in. Hi, I'm with Red. Uh, can you DM me when you're safe? We'd like to talk to you. And another person. Hi, this is Red. Are you able to provide more information when you're safe? Thank you. And another. I am with Red in New York. Can you DM me when you're safe? And, an, and a third three from the same organization. At what point is, I don't feel that this is protecting social sources here. I feel that this is exposing them to harassment. Individually, no one's done anything wrong. They've done what their assignment editors have asked them to do. Um, but what they can do is coordinate their efforts so that at the very least, it's just one person doing that. Uh, we all understand the pressures that, they're un that people are under, but we also know that this approach does not work. So she updated to say she was safe and then closed with, and if you're a reporter looking for a story, read these next words carefully. I am not interested. So all of those efforts from the journalists who have that pressure, have to do this, have to risk it, it's meant that this person has not wanted to give their story to anyone. So always think, will you realistically get something at this time? And what, at what cost? This is something, you know, uh, the amplification of someone's social media presence at an event can uh, mean that there are consequences for them. Um, and I've tried to illustrate this. We are, I'm sure that you, when you've been trying to source UGC, you have seen other news organizations jump in. Now, if someone is in an active situation and they are hiding, um, and they are getting uh, reply, at replies on, on Twitter because they've posted something that they want, and they're hiding in a room which is completely silent, and their phone, and they're just getting retweet after retweet, or reply after reply, or DM after DM. This is what it sounds like. Now, if you're hiding and you're, you don't think, oh, you know what, something's going on, I should probably put my phone on mute. It's not, it's not what people do. And then reporters ask for phone numbers you know, during an active situation. Are you really going to call someone as they're hiding? It's just something to think about when it's, it's an easy way to protect a source if you think about what your communication might do um, in that situation. We are also now aware and it's been coming for a while. I used to think about, I used to talk about this hypothetically, but now there's actual examples. People who are committing crimes are, fo are following their actions on social media. Now, as a news organization uh, tweeting something, that's very different to someone who is uh, sharing something with five of their followers. If we then amplify that by communicating with them uh, a lot or, or retweeting them or uh, show, you know, showing off their handles, that, can, that could give someone information that would, um, could be used to target these individuals who just happen to be caught up in this. 
There's other ways that we can protect people doing live events, um, and that's and to reduce the harassment. So um, this was during the uh, the shooting or, or the the massacre of of I think around 50 British tourists uh, and uh, and people from other places in um, Tunisia uh, on the beach outside of a hotel. Now this was posted on Instagram. The first person jumps in. Hi, I'm a journalist. Are you at the scene of the hotel attack, a very reasonable question to ask. Then other people start coming in and the person actually responds, five to six people are killed from the boat, I'm here, I can't talk, I have only three photos. So usually you're, you're you know, can you talk to us um, and are these photos yours, do you have any more? This person has uniquely answered all of these questions that people, most people need um, very quickly. But they get many requests um, for to be able to communicate with this person. Now this person who has just, don't forget, witnessed lots of dead bodies on the beach. So they're, they're not a journalist, they do not intend to be there, they have just witnessed something truly horrendous and now they're, and they posted something and instead of being helpful they are now, or they have now been bombarded. Again, no one is doing anything wrong here by communicating, because that's, that's our job. We have to communicate, but there are certain things that we, we don't need to ask for their, uh, for their details, because actually, just a few lines after this, he gave his phone number. So there's so many people messaging, can I have your phone number, can I have your phone number, can we talk? He's given it, but he's also said he can't talk, so you can follow up later. All, a lot of the messaging is therefore, is redundant and probably not fair. Um, I think I've just used this as a good example of what you have to do. This is uh, George Sargent from Reuters. Um, I've just seen these po photos you've posted. I hope you're safe. Um, did you take these photos? If so, can Reuters have permission to include them? We distribute here. Uh, we'll include this restriction to you uh, and a an non-screen credit. Many thanks and please stay safe. Providing his own contact details, just rather than asking for, because your communication with them is is going to be fairly limited if they do actually respond. So, coordinate your operation. Really, if you can possibly work out a way in your newsroom for only one person to communicate, whether that's just saying, hey, I, have you seen this? I'm going to message this person. P leave, this, leave this to me, leave this source to me. That, that could be the way to do it. Um, read the other comments that they've left. It's also a very good way uh, to, to work on the verification. When someone posts something that's a hoax, often people will comment on, on the fact that it's a hoax very quickly if they've seen it before. It's very good to read the comments. Um, has somebody else already given, got the answer that, that, to the question that you wish to ask? So by reading through the comments, they might have said, all media can have access, but please don't contact me, in which case you don't need to contact them. And can you get that same information in another way? Have they posted their contact details? Can you just pick up the phone? Um, if they are safe or at a different time. So there's a few, there's also some other people that we can protect. That's the people, there are the social sources who are at the event, but there are also just other people on social media who just get caught up in our actions sometimes. So this is an example from um, Orlando. Um, Someone in Australia, guys, I'm not at Pulse, I live in Australia, but I was sitting on my timeline when mutual followers started live tweeting the incident. It was very obvious he was in Australia. All of his social history for the last, you know, 48 hours suggested that he was in Australia. His bio said Australia, um, yet he gets requests like this. Hi, glad you're safe. I'm from this organization. Can you confirm that you took this video and that we have permission to use it? You'll be credited. He was not, it's not his video, he's very clearly not there, he's very clearly said it's not his. Um, you're not gonna be crediting the right person. This is kind of unbelievable, this one. Um, hi, can you direct me to some of the people tweeting from the incident? We are following from this news organization, thank you. As journalists, we should not be asking random people on social media who have access to the same tools and less of the tools and information that we have to, ch to tell us who, to, who we should follow. Um, and then 
now uh, other people, wow, look at how these left-wing media sickos jump in here with no regard for human life. Barely are you okay? Give me the vid, please. Well, this is kind of true, but this person who isn't in Orlando, who has nothing to do with it, who's just been retweeting things, shouldn't attract this kind of, these kinds of comments just because journalists have given him that attention. So now we can kind of segue into, into protecting sources from, with, through live video. There are so many different ways that you can live stream now. Um, some of them are known, some of them are not known, some of them go in and come in to favour, some go out of favour. Um, but we do know that live video is, is not going anywhere. This is a periscope from outside the Pulse nightclub that was uh, being live streamed as the situation was ongoing. So there are some things to think about here. What, if you, if you start to uh, amplify this content as it's live, we know that sometimes people, when they know that there's a live camera pointed at them, their actions, that, that uh, changes the way that they act. Um, we also know that uh, these people are on the scene and maybe witnessing something that's awful. Um, again, by communicating with someone who's there or amplifying their presence, what danger does it put? People may wish to act up in front of the camera, but people may also wish to uh, stop the cameras. And in Syria, we saw that a lot when people were live streaming from rooftops, the regime was targeting, uh, targeting those live streamers because they could see exactly where they were when they were still landmarks in most of the cities. Um, I, I haven't blurred out this user because she, I think most people know, know of this now. This is from, from last week in Dallas. The tweet says, I am so scared. Okay, so this person has, has admitted that she, is, that she is scared, that she um, is in this situation. She doesn't know what's going on. We know more about what's going on than she does at this point. Um, and I wanted to have an example about the dangers of kind of live streaming and location. This and and the tweet came up actually. So, uh, Alison, where where this is from a reporter? Where were you located exactly when you took this video? Bearing this was while the situation was ongoing. Someone else jumps in. Why would you answer that question if she's in the situation that she's in? Literally brainless. And then a sarcastic response from the reporter. And then, if there were gunshots around me, the last thing I would do is publicly tweet my exact location. Think a little. So with live streaming, because there's not even a delay, um, we, we, have, we are in the danger of pinpointing um, people's exact locations. Um, I also want to show another uh, case from, around this uh, person who was live streaming. This is a snapshot of what, um, if you have content, that news organizations want. This is a snapshot of most of them, well, not actually not, not all of them, but these are all requests from journalists to this one individual asking for access to that content. Um, she responded to many of them, which is rare, but again, it doesn't, and no one here is doing anything wrong individually, but there might be something that we need to think about moving forward as an industry in order to not put sources off and also yeah, to protect them. So is there a better way? Well, there isn't an industry standard, but there are some things that we can do. For example, you don't have to add to that, uh, that barrage of tweets by, looking, by working out other ways that you might be able to communicate with them. Um, email is a little less intense. Uh, direct messages, you can put a lot more into a direct message than you can a, uh, a, an at reply. Uh, and the, it's not that difficult to find out people's phone numbers as long as you also consider the right, the appropriate time to contact them. So just the last points, um, protecting social sources in terms of assignments versus discovery. We are all very familiar with, um, you know, we need snow pictures. We need snow pictures, weather pictures, show us your hot day, show us. That is, that is a, a, a complete, we've been doing it since the dawn of television, I think. Um, that's, that's a completely reasonable way to create an assignment for, for your audience. But there are, if you had a, a policy on, on assignments for the audience, this, it's very different if the situation is dangerous. So 
do you have any pictures of what's going on at the school to share with, with this news organisation? No, because I didn't think to take pictures while I thought my life was in jeopardy. Shows a very different kind of assignment. It's also, you know, hurricanes or tornadoes. Hey, send us your tornado pictures. It's not necessarily responsible. It might put someone... People want to be on TV. People want to get that recognition sometimes. But um, they might put themselves at risk. So is it better to discover pe content that people have already created or ask them to go and create it f for you? Um, if you give a monetary incentive, then it might mean that people take uh, unnecessary risks. Does it expose people to danger if they take an additional action? If someone does get injured, uh, or worse, then what is your responsibility to them if, you, if they are doing something because you have asked them to do it? A simple question, does it, does it, are they covered by your insurance? <coughs> it's something that not many people know, but it's something that people need to think about. Um, what are your responsibilities to them? Yes, people, you know, it might be in the terms and conditions of upload. It might, but actually sometimes we have a bit more of a responsibility to our own audience to keep them safe. So um, to summarize, protecting social sources, assess the risk to you, to them, uh, not just to them now, but to them in a few minutes, in a few hours, in a few days. Is it worth it? Consider that danger to the sources all the time. It shouldn't, most of the time, yes, we can work with them, but just, we just have to ask the question, will they be safe if we do? Consider how visible your actions are and how much your work might amplify uh, them or a situation. And I think most importantly, coordinate your efforts within your own news organizations uh, or your own, in your own teams in order to to protect people. Thank you. Thanks, Toby. Um, any questions from anyone in the room? I guess not, yeah. Well, there are a couple online. Um, what are the kind of broader things? A lot of good if we can probably go back, actually. Um, the kind of individual, say, no. ways. Um, the individual takeaways for what people can or should be thinking about. Are there any kind of broader um, things which are more on a management level or something that between like, networks and platforms? Have you got any thoughts there? Yeah, it's, it's the most unsexy thing to talk about in newsrooms, but workflows are so important now, especially as so much content is passing through newsrooms and so many more people are, are working with UGC and social. When I started, I was you know, I was alone in the newsroom, but and and now it's. I think, as you said here, you've got a team working on UGC. Uh, it that means that you need to hand over to people. You need to have ways of processing things. I think visualizing the stuff that you're working on in newsrooms is important. I'm a big advocate of still having. You know, don't leave all of your communication to um, to to digital channels within your own teams. There's a point where you say, "Is anyone working on this?" I am. That standy up, shouty outy moment is still really important to stop overlap and to, to help those people. So workflows is, is probably the, the key thing that, that needs to be looked at um, in terms of protecting people. Um, just, just a process as well. Checklists. It doesn't even have to be a checklist that sits on everyone's desk, but it has to be a, you know, a mental checklist that you go through. Are they safe? Will they be safe? Um, how do we keep them safe? Any, anything to add from it, anyone here? It's cool, if not, we've got questions online, but if anyone wanted to chip in. Okay, something else that, um, that's come up was this, that this uh, general, this morning, this live stream is about putting the community first and looking after the community. Someone was asked, and what about taking care of yourself in breaking news situations? Um, are there anything that people should be doing or thinking about in, in those kind of situations for themselves? I think it's, when we need, there's that pressure to jump on a piece of content to ask, people for permission to, to uh, that's become a, a process in itself. I think it's a process that needs to be refined because there are certain dangers there. So um, I worked a lot on Syria and I was originally dealing with uh, activists or protesters who became activists, who became um, parts of you know, the Free Syrian Army, um, but then, uh, and militants, and then some of them became IS. 
and you so so you'd suddenly you do the same process that you had always done automatically and then you'd be like oh, actually I just I think I just communicated with someone who potentially is 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 very dangerous um, and might be able to cause me harm in a way, in a certain way and I'm exposing myself um, to those people so think about it's not just a standard process yes do this this and this the other thing that needs to be considered there is who, by communicating with this person am I at risk um, and I can say it sneaks up on you without you realizing if if you're so used to doing this thing every day um, and the situation that you're doing is slightly out, out of the ordinary um, that it's those out of ordin the ordinary events that you need to just take a, take a moment and stop that. Especially um, from a management level, thinking about your junior staff who might not have that ex experience in order to just identify that risk. Mm -hmm. um, and that was something that made me think when you were mentioning there about um, identifying you know, things that might identify yourself and put yourself in danger. But also the, the sources, when you are crediting and attributing pieces of content, pictures or videos to sort of touched on here. How do you, do you what, in what circumstances do you know whether it's going to be putting them in danger or, and you've kind of done this with the ONA ethic code, which you worked on. And yeah, about so I, um, with the Online News Association, I devised, uh, co-devised a, 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 an ethics code for the way that we deal with social news gathering, and that does things like consider the cre consider ha how you credit people, um, and how it and when it's safe to do so. Um, what do you credit means? I, I know AJ Plus is incredibly good at, at uh, crediting, and I often use that you guys as examples for how to credit. Um, but sometimes when uh, just generally when someone's sharing something with only f you know if they've if they've got five followers. Um, if, if you embed their tweet or their Instagram photo, that's without ask, without talking to them. That's they don't expect that they're going to get that attention then if they've only got five followers because people don't think that their content is 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 interesting for news organisations. Um, also, by by crediting people. Um, it's not always the, the safest way for them, or it can, there can be consequences further on. During the Charlie Hebdo attacks, there was someone who had an amazing piece of content. She was credited, she had a business, um, her name was credited, and so when you search for her business, which is her name, you get 10, 20 pages on Google uh, with the Charlie Hebdo story before you even get to her business, and that's ruined her business. So yes, she, you know, you asked for permission, but they didn't know, they didn't know what, it wasn't informed cons consent necessarily, not you, generally. Um, informed consent means do they know the implications uh, of sharing this content with you or being credited? Maybe it's best to leave the credit off as long as they give that permission. Um, anything else from here before we hand over to Tom? Cool, well, thanks again, folks.